Uh, good afternoon. I'm, uh, we're sitting here with uh, Steve Blackner of the Chanticleer Books. And I forgot what the town you're in. I'm in the town of Sonoma. Sonoma, California, wine country, beautiful place. Uh, we're at the Seattle Ambrine Book Fair. It's Sunday, October 11th. And, uh, Steve, good to see you back in Seattle. I've been with Steve for uh, probably 20, 25 years now. Uh, just to start off, tell us a little bit about your background, your family, where you were born yeah. and raised? Yeah, I was born in, in Boston, Massachusetts in 1955, and yeah, my dad was a student at MIT, finishing up his uh, master's. He was a meteorologist, and we moved to California in 1959 when he worked, started a job at Stanford Research Institute, and so I grew up in the kind of the greater Stanford community. Um, my own academic background is kind of nil, actually. I was a sort of a, a what would you call it, a, a serial class taker, but without ever kind of pulling the trigger on anything. Which and, college were you? You know, I actually did, uh, my first college experience was the University of Copenhagen, in Copenhagen, Denmark. I had a Danish girlfriend that I met in California, and then went over and lived with her for a year, and her dad was a director of an uh, international exchange student program, and so he said, well, I want to go to the university. And I said, sure. So I went to, uh, to the University of Copenhagen. That was a start. Yeah. No and degree there? Where did you go? No degree there. Um, really, Sonoma State University. I went there for a couple of years as an English major and was managing uh, a new bookstore in Sonoma County at the time. So you dropped sort out of, before? I did, yeah. I, I kind of took books as a as a trade direction. Sounds um, very so, similar to me, another dropout yeah. English major. Exactly, yeah. I, I, my first bookstore job was a part-time job in 1980. Um, I got a part-time job at Treehorn Books in Santa Rosa Beach. It was sort of one of the last of the big old used bookstores in Northern California. In what town is that? Uh, in Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa. Yeah, still, in still in business. Still in business. Yeah, they started in I think they opened in 78, uh, two partners that uh, had connections with all the big thrift stores around, you know. Yeah. yeah. Now, what year would that have been? You went uh, that was 1980. Uh, worked part-time. That kind of was the bug that bit me there, I think. And uh, worked for them, not for very long, and then took a full-time job at a new bookstore chain. Did that for six months. That was B. Dalton, actually. Yeah. In Santa Rosa. In Santa Rosa. They just opened a store in the mall. That was a great expansion year for those big Yeah, it stores. was. Yeah, and that was a good experience. You know, uh, certainly you kind of learn in the new book trade what people are reading and, you know, about backlist books and uh, essentially what we sell as uh, antiquarian booksellers are the first editions of the backlist of the chain stores. Yes. But uh, I jumped ship from B. Dalton. You know, that was a, you know, it was a terrible atmosphere to work in. You know, and got a job with a local chain new bookstore in Sonoma County called Copperfields Books. Yeah, and worked for them. Managed two of their stores, I think, for two or three years. And decided I wanted to get back into the used book thing. I, been a you know frequenter of used bookstores and kind of scouted. In fact, yeah, I think the way I really got my feet wet in buying and selling was scouting books and then selling to Moe's. So I do probably every two weeks I take my boxes of books down to Moe's books. And Mo himself was usually working the buying counter in Chicago. And he'd actually, even if he wasn't buying himself, he'd kibitz the buyers. You know, he'd learn a lot from listening to Mo and you know, talking about why this was something to buy, why this is something to reject. So they're indirectly, at least, was an early mentor. Yeah, I'd say, yeah, yeah. yeah. And by 1985, I was ready to leave the new book business and actually bought the inventory of a used bookstore in Sonoma County. What was that called? That was a vicarious experience. Uh, A guy named John Wabert who is now the owner of Shakespeare and Company bookstore on Telegraph Avenue. So I bought his books, maybe 
4,000 bucks. It was fucking good. Yeah. That's some price. good books. Yeah, it was a good price, actually. And I approached my, my employers in Copperfields and said, what would you think about opening a news bookstore? And they didn't have any experience with it, but they trusted me and liked my managerial style or whatever and said, well, you know, what do you think we could do? And uh, there was sort of a convergence of things and there was a new bookstore going out of business in downtown Santa Rosa. So all their fixtures, everything was available. The location was also available. So they moved out and I moved in the next day with my 4,000 books. And it distorted it very well. It was, uh, you know, a general used bookstore. Did you keep the same name? Uh, we called it Copperfield's Annex. So, but it was your store. It was, yeah. I was fifty percent owner. Yeah, 50. yeah, yeah, yeah. They were basically sort of the business acumen and right. some financial, uh, uh, you know, credit line for the bank and That's stuff. Nice. But, I wish I'd had that when I started out. Yeah. Well, it was a good thing, you know. It, because they had a name that was right. recognized throughout the county, and the business really took off. And, uh, I opened a second store in Napa in probably four years, and that was a bit of an overextension. Just trying to get employees, trying to get a good manager, you know, that was difficult. Uh, by that time, I had 15 employees between the two stores, and found that. I had become more of a manager than a bookseller. You know. Although, of course, it, along the way, there were a lot of collections purchased, a lot of books sold. The business did very well. Um, but I burned out and sold my half interest back to my partners. And so my initial $5,000 investment, I returned about, I got about 200000 my share of it. Well, stores. So that's that was my big good uh, return. Yeah, I thought so. Uh, that's <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's yeah. not common in the book trade. But I, I that. you know, I didn't really realize that at the time, but uh, and in fact, my whole experience with the general used bookstore sort of bucked the trend because it was a constant positive cash flow situation. I bought books and the books sold. I bought more books. And sold. Now, of course, yeah. you talk about a time when there really was no internet business to speak. You know, there wasn't even really a computer industry to siphon people's interest away. So uh, we're talking about through the door? Uh, 1985 opening, selling out 1993. And, yeah, and I took two years off, uh, sort of, you know, tried to come up with something better to do than sell books and gave up. And uh, so I opened Chanticleer Books in, I guess it was 90. Uh, well, that's interesting. Uh, I would have sworn I was earlier than that. You know, maybe it was. I, uh, let's see. I was eight years with Copperfields. Two years off. Yeah, it might have been uh, 93 or 94. Yeah. yeah. I know, that's it. only uh, 16 years ago. Yeah. It's longer than that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. who knows? Wrong. How did you uh, select the name Shannon? Well... It was, you know, the literary, the Chaucer's uh, Canterbury Tales, the Nuns Priest's Tales, Chanticleer. And I, I like the, I like the story, and I like the image of the rooster. Uh, in fact, I think, you know, the reason I, the real reason was I had this book on old English signs, and on the title page there was this rooster. I realized, hey, that'd be perfect, you know, perfect image for <laughs> Chanticleer nice. books. Yeah. You know, there's that kind of Rostand play. Yeah, and I've got multiple copies of that. Beautiful of rooster yeah. on the front. That's yeah. a great, great book cover. Yeah. Well, that was uh, right around the time then when uh, the computer really was starting to uh, make its way into our trade. Yeah, yeah. Were you comfortable with that early on? Is it something you embraced early on, or did you resist it, or did you just kind of were you ambivalent about it? How did you yeah, first I think, start I think I'm kind of, you know, I I sort of watched it for maybe a year. I owned a computer, and I remember when, I guess, Interlock was the first one on the block, really. And I signed up on that early on. I think originally, if I remember correctly, it was more 
a research tool somehow. But yeah, it was it was yeah. sort of a primitive book matching site. Yeah. Um, you actually paid for connection time to right. get into their database and it didn't involve a lot of time wasting because it was a per hour thing to yeah. computer up. But uh, yeah. uh, it was the predecessor to what is now a Libris yeah, uh, right. online yeah. Uh, yeah. book search. Which I have ambivalent feelings about Libris. I've been a member a couple of times and quit. And, and just, I don't know. But uh, I got on Abe right away when they started. Uh, well, what, what, is the, what is the role in your business these days? The computer is is one of the three legs of my three-legged stool that keeps me seated. I guess book fairs, in-store sales, the computer. Now you still and have an open shop. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Can you I've, tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I've got uh, when I opened Chanticleer Books in, in Sonoma, I, uh, part of the contract I had with my former partners was a non-competition agreement. So I actually couldn't open a store within ten miles of any of their stores. So. They actually had four stores in Sonoma County, so it restricted me to either Sonoma or Healdsburg, That's or funny. somewhere way out in the boonies. And a lot of people are of the mind that the more bookshops close together, the better it is for everybody. Yeah. Apparently yeah. they didn't think yeah. so. They, they didn't. Um, more in the, yeah. in the new book mentality. Which yeah, yeah. They, they had some bad uh, policies, I think. And, the two stores that I sold my interest back to them both folded within uh, six years of my life. Is there any Copperfield books going these There places? are, yeah. Just those, yeah, they have. Uh, the same people you're falling apart Yeah, from. although they don't actually do the running of the business anymore. They have a higher gun that runs things. But they still have, I think, five stores. Only two of them are these ones. But, let's see, what did you ask me? Uh, just a little about the. the oh, Chanticleer. Operation. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, when I opened in Sonoma, in whenever it was, 95, it was with the intention of kind of recreating my previous uh, type of store, which is a general amusement store. It's collectible books and, you know, just reading and stuff. And Plaza Bookshop was also in Sonoma. And, uh, Plaza Bookshop. Boris, yeah, and Boris actually worked for me at Copperfields for about a year oh, before really? he opened his store. Though he had a long history in the trade before that. It was just, I was kind of re-entry uh, point for him to get back in. That's great. I didn't know that. Yeah. It was really great having him as an employee because he brought, you know, a lot of experience. One of my other employees then had been a former employee of Warren Brock's bookhouse. Who is that? A guy named uh, Ishmael Ford, uh, also known as James Ford. I remember uh, hearing that name, uh, Warren Brock's books, uh, yeah. long time shop in uh, San Diego, which yeah. sadly just closed a yeah. few yeah. months ago. About a year after the death of Chuck Dalberg, a long time ago. Yeah, I never actually, I met Chuck. I didn't ever go to his store. But, uh, well, yeah. the store was fine, but Chuck. <laughs> Chuck was greater than the store. Mm -hmm. one of the great guys in the trade. Well, when I told him that his former employee, Ishmael Ford, worked for me, he was, it was really, a, he was not impressed so much as just he had very fond memories of Ishmael. Uh, but, so my store, when I first opened in Sonoma, was about 1,500 square feet, general use bookstore. And I opened on a street just off the plaza in the same week as another used bookstore opened on the same block. And so we had a thing going. That was called Apex Books. And he didn't last long, but it was an interesting uh, attempt at having a, a used bookstore uh, just built on genre fiction uh, with the focus of uh, kind of film tie in stuff. So he was doing mysteries and science fiction and stuff. But mostly as relating to, to film and TV. Your focus uh, in your selling was and is what? General. This is general. Yeah. Yeah. That's my opinion. So I, am, I would identify myself as an opportunistic seller. Yeah. Yeah. Take yeah. advantage of the opportunities. Yeah, and you try yourself. to know as much. Uh, I mean, I'm a trivia nut, and you know, I know a little bit about a lot of things. I don't really specialize, but if I could say my areas of focus are California history, uh, books on decorative arts, and classics. And, uh, I took a lot of Latin over the years.
there. So oh, that's I can read that and you fairly it. well. I did, yeah. 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 I took it and it became some. Well, I took it and then I retook it. I think that was the key thing. Sort of as a hobby at the local junior college. He was an uh, ex priest that started teaching class. It was a, you know, a great way to spend the evening. Let's see. So these days, how does the, the retail uh, aspect of your business fit into the whole? Is it like a quarter of it? Or? It's really about a third. About a third. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. very good. Do you have employees these days? I have one uh, helper who's. Uh, I was just telling Ken Carmio about my relationship with this helper. He's a customer of Ken's, uh, customer of Phil Parajas also. Uh, he happens to live near me. Uh, Phil Lennon, and he's a very eclectic, high-end collector who uh, likes to you know, sit behind a desk and uh, sell books to people, but uh, he works for credit and usually spends quite a bit of money when he's been in the store for three or four days on a stretch, but I'll get back and it'll be a nice check. Uh, 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 my employees and uh, meat checks. Yeah. Uh, the rest of the business that would be... Uh, um, online sales. Um, I struggle to get more than 3,000 books online, but yeah, you know, my monthly sales are good. And I do maybe... I don't know, six or eight fairs a year, I think. Are these mostly in the West? Yeah, just in the West. I've, I've really never felt the urge to do the East Coast fairs, just the expense of shipping the books. Expense and, the time. Yeah, the so time, yeah, time away is, it is hard. Yeah. yeah. But any, yeah. any fair within a close yeah. area of where you live want to support? Yeah, in fact, yeah, you know, my first book fair was... Uh, uh, there was a short-lived fair that started up in Marin County. It was a benefit for the Dominican College Library. Here, did you do that? No, I remember hearing that. Yeah, it, I think Michael Good was one of the runners of that. Michael Good and uh, Byron Spooner, I think. He used to have books revisited in Santa Fe. And, um, anyway, that was my first book fair. I think that was probably 1987. And that was a neat experience. I remember the Weinstein brothers came, flew up and scouted the fair. And I had the first of the, all the A.A. Milne in jackets and sold them to them. They liked yeah. those. They did, oh yeah. I remember that the first book fair I ever did, too, was when Lou flew up to Seattle yeah. in 78. and relieved me of a large stack of mm-hmm. books before I knew what would happen. Yeah, so yeah. Happy experience. And I think I'd recently bought the collection of... Um, film and theater books and memorabilia. I was selling at that fair too. Did really well. Um, that was my first experience at you know, buying a special collection, you know, a large collection of one focus, and then trying to find customers for it. You know, making a list of specialty libraries and you know doing a catalog. And like all that kind like of you stuff. already alluded to, you had the wherewithal to look at these and say, "Well, I'm not sure where these are going to go, but I know." They're Find yeah, it might have been more like, who the hell am I going to sell these to? Uh, this brings up something else, too, I, I did want to ask you. You mentioned this uh, theater film collection. So far in your 20 plus years in the trade, is there one particular incident by uh, a particular book you got or a sale mix? One event that kind of stands out is like the best thing ever. Well, yeah, I did have one of those, uh, you know, those sort of dream buys that uh, people write fiction about, but I had a real one about it. Uh, that I, honestly, I have to say, at the time I wasn't experienced enough to exploit it to its full potential, but I did the best I could at the time. But it was a, a state in Ashland, Oregon, that the executor of the estate lived in Santa Rosa, and... I was like the tenth dealer he'd approached to try to get interested to go up to Ashland to look at this house full of books. House full of books. These two apparently elderly maiden lady sisters that both died and, and their whole house that they lived in for their whole lives. And uh, they were in, they were eclectic readers. They actually bought Arkham House books. They bought uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs in the first edition. 
uh, just William Falcon, uh, Thornton W. Burgess. I mean, everything was, was there. That's and, Thornton yeah. Burgess and Falcon. I know, yeah. Well, you could almost see, you know, if they were buying for decades, you know, what yeah. they bought the Burgess in, you know, 1920 or Falcon in 1930. Growing up. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, you know, they had uh, that dark carnival, you know, Ray Bradbury's first book. Uh, they had uh, Cornell Woolrich, you know, everything they had. Uh, I think I like that even better, Cornell Woolrich. The Thornton Burgess, yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. So the guy, you know, I, he actually showed me a picture of one of the rooms with books, you know, in a case. And this is how inexperienced I was at the time. This is probably 1986. I saw Safira and the Slave Room. I thought, all right, well, there's a Willa Cather book there. You know, what the hell, I'll drive up to Ashland. It's only a five-hour drive. It's January. I'll bring my chains to go over the Siskiyou Pass. Yeah, the house wasn't heated. Yeah, it was cold. But uh, And he wanted me to take everything. And in retrospect, I should have. I could have everything for $2,000. And, uh, and he really was insistent on that. And there was a lot of junk, of course. You know, there was tons of crap, but it, it would have required, uh, you know, a couple storage units to put everything in. Or So I talked him into letting me give him $2,500 and just take what I wanted. I've done that, too. Yeah, and, you know, it was, it was a reasonable thing to do, and I you know, made a ton of dough out of it. What kind of vehicle? I had my Toyota pickup truck, you know, with a shell. It was a long bed, so you know, I could get everything Oh, I fit everything in, and, nice. yeah, I just dragged my tail... You know, I can't actually remember. I, I don't think I put chains on. I, I've done the sisters yeah. in the snow. It's, yeah. It's not fun. Well, that's an illustration of uh, being ready to take advantage of an opportunity. Yeah. You know, I, I did it to the limit of my imagination at the time, but I think, you know, one thing we learned is that, uh, you know, if you have an opportunity, a legitimate opportunity that doesn't require any compromise of your ethics, to take the whole wad and go do it. Yeah. That was about 1987. Yeah. yeah. So you, yeah. you were still under the cop. I was, yeah. yeah. And, yeah, you know, having the uh, the employees and everything gave me, you know, the time to, to go up there. And for me, it was a jaunt, you know. It was nice to, to get away. And, uh, I think I got my brother to come with me. Just keep it coming. Yeah. Maybe hollow yeah. boxes. Yeah. Yeah, he kind of scratched his head over the whole affair. He was a computer program. He only wanted his own music. Yeah, you know, he's kind of looking at his... I remember when I pulled the dark carnival out of the pile on the floor and held it up to me. This is a $500 book. So now it's more than a $500 I'd give you $500 for yeah. it right now. But in 1987, you know, no, it's, you know, it's good money for it. Yeah. But in later years, I, I did have a good uh, thing a few years ago uh, when I was in between my first Chanticleer location and my present one. Oh, you, uh, you have moved? During the I moved, yeah. Uh, I actually, uh, lo- uh, my lease ended in my first spot. It took about two years to find another good space to move into, where I've what now been about six years. What did you do in the meantime? Yeah, I worked from home. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't have some recollection. Yeah. Wow, you worked from home. But I, I got a referral from another Sonoma County dealer, uh, Cliff Meter, who was an architecture. You know, yeah. um, he referred someone to me that had some Henry James books. Turned out the woman was the granddaughter of William James, great-granddaughter of William James, and she was sitting on a, the remnants of the family's oh, collection. Oh, Christmas. Wow. Yeah. So there wasn't a lot of material, but it was really Ownership good material. Signatures? Yeah. Oh, Mostly uh, gift inscriptions back and forth. That's nice. Yeah. Gee. So I, I brokered that for her to the, the Hooper Library. Yeah. Nice, nice job. Yeah, that was, that was nice. To be doing it by, you know, in between space. Well, it's interesting. You're you're one of the few uh, who seems to be doing well with the shop and these other things. Uh, what do you see about the future of the trade? Where, where do you see that we're going? Cat has a trade. 
Yeah, you know, I think about that a lot, and I, I don't necessarily mean anything, see anything changing dramatically. Let me phrase you know. it a little differently. What, as the trade is today here in 2000, what would you say is, is right? What are things that are being done right? What do you think are ways that the book trade can collectively improve itself? Yeah, right. Well, I think, you know, the right thing is having fairs like this. Venues where uh, people can still actually handle it. Yeah, yeah. Promoting, you know, knowledge about this and uh, well, somehow. Let's, let's ask this too. If someone, some younger person, probably or maybe a retired person, were contemplating going into the trade now, would you encourage them to do that? And if so, how would you tell them to go about it? I mean, how to get that hands on experience in the 21st century? Yeah, well, I, I think I would. I would suggest to anyone who really wants to go into the trade to uh, apprentice someone, to talk their way into someone. But this is where we get the wall, because yeah. people roughly our age, we had opportunities to work for other booksellers, and there are few yeah. that are open shops. Yeah, uh, I know. If yeah. someone's in your area, would you give them a job to run an apprentice? I had a guy come in wanting to, and I didn't like him. I just didn't like his manner, but I understood you know, that he was doing the right thing. Right. Yeah, but uh, I wasn't the right person for him. But uh, I did tutor someone once years ago and uh, volunteered. You know, he worked for me for a couple months and then went on to open a store in Davis and was in business for 15 years. Well, your your yeah. mentoring of this uh, wealthy collector sounds like you're doing this all a service, keeping him entertained. Wait, who's that? The, the one who works for you now. Oh, him, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You yeah. forgot him already. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. And he's, he is my best customer. Uh, and, yeah, I know, it's a, it's a sweetheart deal. <laughs> well, what do you see for yourself? Any, uh, you don't see retiring in the next uh, little bit, or at all? No, I don't think I'll no. ever retire. I, I, I think I'll retire from an open shop at some point. That could be. Not to the trade. I, I've yet to speak with anyone who uh, intends to retire. Yeah, I mean, I generally like dealing with the public. I like talking with people. I like you know, having a place to go to work. You know, well, I've, I've never doors. seen you in your shop, but I've watched you at book fairs yeah. enough to know if that is true. Yeah, I mean, you can sort of immediately have empathy and respect towards someone who is interested in books. Well, it, it kind of feeds back yeah. because I've observed people are very comfortable talking to. Oh. Wow. Well, I think we've pretty much covered everything. All right. Thank you for joining well, me for this you talk. For and, uh, hope it wasn't too horrible. No. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay.